celebration of life. Welcome to Simcha, a celebration of life. I'm your host, Eitan Berger. Today in our series, Teachings of the Maharal, Rabbi Whitmont chats to us about another passion of the Maharal, namely mathematics, and how it relates to us in the Torah. One of the areas that fascinated the Maharal was numbers. And numbers play a large role in his conceptualization of the world. And it, it's clearly stemming from the, 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 the arena of thought at the time. We see a burgeoning of mathematical thought in the same time period, the resurrection of ancient Greek works on mathematics. And he, of course, is intimately involved with astronomy. And astronomy, according to the Greeks, was the uh, pinnacle of, um, of mathematical endeavor, which was almost applied mathematics. And the Maharal spends a fortune of time relating to the mathematical underpinnings of the universe and their relationship with, with Torah. I'll give a couple of examples of this. Um, we all know that a Brit Milah, a circumcision, takes place on the eighth day. And the Maharal's question is, well, why does it take place on the eighth day? So he explains that the way that the universe or the physical world is actually constructed, if you look at it, is, is almost through seven dimensions. You have up, down, right, left, forward, and backwards. Now that encompasses our three-dimensional reality. And of course, it's all the six directions almost. Now the seventh is, of course, perhaps the most important one, which is the initial point, the center point, the locus, which creates the map, the grid, that allows you to orient yourself in the universe. And it's all very well and good to know that you have six options of movement, but where are you? And that seventh point, almost the zero point uh, at the center of the map, that's what centers everything. So there are seven dimensions that he locates within physicality, within space at least, uh, and he does address time as well. But there are seven dimensions within space that he looks at and says, well, that really encompasses physical space. And therefore, anything that moves beyond seven is moving beyond space and beyond the confines of regular physical experience. And he says, well, that explains to a large extent why certain parts of Jewish experience are centered around the concept of eight, because there's a clear attempt by Torah to state that in certain parts of our lives we need to actually extend ourselves and attempt to reach beyond ourselves. And the concept of Brit Milah, he therefore says, is not just this idea of uh, gathering everybody and, and having a party. It's far beyond that. It's an active attempt to declare that as people, and definitely as Jewish people, we need to attempt to transcend the purely physical existence which we live. And that's why it's on the eighth day, because eight is one step above the physical world. And he says, and that's the concept of a circumcision, because what is a circumcision? A circumcision at the end of the day is the removal of a part of the body that hasn't got a direct function or need. In fact, it possibly, as we see today, especially in the fight against AIDS, it may even be deleterious to retain a foreskin for one's health. But it doesn't really play a role in the body. And this is part of our argument in the Midrashim. And he brings, as, we, as we've said, he really is a champion of the Midrash. But he brings many of the Midrashim which describe discussions between Jewish sages and Greek or Roman uh, thinkers about why we perform a, a circumcision. And the discussions hinge upon this point. Is the natural world which God made, is that not perfect enough? And the Jewish response is, no, it's not. The Jewish response is that human choice is really the pinnacle of creation. That human choice about what we do and how we utilize and engage with the physical world, that is the crowning glory of all of creation. And Hashem has created the world unfinished so that we can partner and actually take the world through our choices to the next level. And that next level, the human choice level, is that level slightly above nature. On the one hand, we are purely physical beings, it would seem. But we have that tiny addition, the addition of the soul, that when combined with the body, takes us beyond our purely physical confines and makes us into metaphysical beings. And our choices can be that. Our choices with what, what we do with the world can, uh, can, actually, can actually transform us. 
from the seventh purely physical existence into the eighth. And this now becomes a metaphor, a trope, which runs through much of the Maharal's writings, where he describes human beings as having that ability to transcend. Not every choice is a transcendent choice, but human beings have the ability to transcend their purely physical boundaries, their purely physical desires, their purely physical and selfish aims in order to reach an eighth level, a level which is truly ideal, truly beautiful, truly sacred, truly holy. The Hida Brut organization was established eight years ago by Rabbi Zamir Cohen with the purpose of spreading the teachings of Judaism through shiurim and lectures. At the beginning of 2008, the organization produced the first Orthodox Jewish religious television channel in Israel. Now, seven years later, Hida Brut are in the process of taking their channel globally by producing Jewish content in English. Hidabrut is really an incredible organization. They started off 12 years ago as a Kirov organization. Kirov, the Hebrew word for outreach, bringing in Jews, introducing Judaism to the common secular Jew who may not have a regular affiliation with Ju Judaism. So they started off as this um, outreach organization from a small apartment in Bnei Brock with a couple of employees. And a few years later, they turned into a television network, which is now, I think, on the air for over eight years. They're distributed through HOT and YES, the cable systems here in Israel. So they are in over a million and a half Israeli homes. And interestingly, they've really reached the hearts and broken through to the secular segment within Israel. So while one would say, you know, it's great to have a religious channel and programming for people of that level of religious persuasion, the reality is those people don't have TVs or internet in their house. So even though we'd be preaching to the choir, they're not the ones watching. The ones that we've reached and are watching are secular Jews. So we're taking that idea and looking at it on a more global reach. We're, we're saying, well, we can produce similar programming, reach people in the same way, their hearts and minds, intellect, but do it all over the world. And we're gonna start in North America. We're gonna, we're creating, we're producing right now a, a, a lot of original programming while aggregating a lot of other content that we're finding on the internet that may not be um, accessible via broadcast and we're creating an English language broadcast network that will hopefully launch later this year in uh, the United States. For me, the film is very uh, important because it shows that the influence of the teacher perhaps is even more important than the influence of the parent. Because the parent, the truth is this is a private school, the parent is away over there, and the teacher's with the kid every day. It reminds me of, you know, the yeshiva experience of many kids who go away to a dormitory. It's true. In a sense, they become, uh, the parents become less influential because it's just the issue of exposure. There's less time available. I remember I, I had this dilemma even with my own kids. They were in Atlanta, and I was encouraged to send them to an out-of-town yeshiva in their high school years, which I did for one year. But afterwards, I felt I needed them to come out because I needed to still be a, an Abba, still needed to be a father with them. I didn't want to lose my parental influence. Mm -hmm. I felt it was important to understand that there is a yeshiva of the home right. that's valuable, that teenagers need to see a functioning family, right. even though I appreciated the contribution of the rabbis to my mm -hmm. son's education. It's a tricky game trying to program religious um, content targeting secular people, secular Jews. We need to give them things that will entertain them, that will engage them, but won't alienate them. So we have to do it with a certain level of subtlety and sophistication that they're used to in terms of the programming they're used to watching. So it's tricky, but producing secular seeming programming that have Torah messages behind them is part of what we're trying to accomplish. So, for instance, you know, on a typical cooking show, it could be very much relegated to the task at hand, the recipe, how to prepare it. Um, you might learn tidbits about the ingredients. But when you consider a religious uh, channel producing a cooking show, we might try to infuse the conversation within the kitchen with things related to stories in the Bible, experiences that other Jews from other cultures might have related to those ingredients, how the different customs affect people geographically. So it's, um, again, it's, um, it's 
trying to find ways to engage and entertain people while not hitting them over the head with the message. So another example is a reality series that we're filming with someone named uh, Rabbi Yom Tov Glazer, who's uh, very prominent within Aish. And he's known as the surfing rabbi. But he's a fascinating character, and uh, anyone would be engaged by the things that he's saying, because it, even though they're Torah-based ideas, they're really universal to our everyday life and ways that we can improve our relationships, our personality traits, and become better people at large, not just about Judaism. Hello, everybody. Here we are in Ben Gurion Airport. This is it. This is the big trip to U.S. of A. Penguins. People always say I should have my own reality show. This Hasid from Jerusalem coming back to his family in the Palisades, showing all the magical things that take place. It is incredible to be back here. Is sometimes it can be that our parents have a bit of a control issue with us. <laughs> Well, the reason we're for an English channel is primarily to reach English-speaking audiences. We could take some of our Hebrew programming, subtitle them in English, and present them and broadcast them in America for English speakers, but we don't feel that that's the best way to connect with that market. So people um, need to be engaged by things that they're familiar with, with uh, entertainment that is consistent with how they're typically um, consuming that entertainment. So we want to reach them in the way that they're accustomed to, but offering them new ideas, new outlooks. You know, the whole self-improvement industry in America is booming. It's not just for religious people. The idea of connecting with one's source, with God, with trying to find the peace of God in us to encourage us to live more moral-centered, uh, um, blissful lives, frankly, is, is something that everyone's on a quest for. It just so happens that we're bringing in some Torah concepts to uh, incorporate to that message. This network exists in Israel for the last eight years. All their Hebrew programming is very successful. They have a quarter of a million subscribers on their website who they're communicating regularly with. So when you look at that number in relation to the population in Israel, that's a very strong penetration. But right now, our main mandate is to produce. We have to bank a lot of programming. We have to produce many shows and have hundreds of hours of programming before we could actually go live to broadcast. So that will ho hopefully happen sometime later this year when we'll actually go live. In terms of other English language countries that we can use this programming for as well, we're in that process of investigating those markets. Anywhere where there's English language and a Jewish population, those are the two criteria that, that would determine us going into that market. Well, anything that we do broadcast will be available on the internet, so we'll have a lot of um, archive footage as well as the same programming being repeated on the internet. Plus, it'll be on a, um, on a cycle. There'll be six to eight hours of original programming every day, and that will be on a you know, three-tiered uh, three cycle every day. So people will have multiple opportunities to see that programming, and then on the internet as well. But the shows... Um, for the most part, are all pre-recorded. I don't think we'll actually have any live television because of the nature of how we're broadcasting. But we will have shows that will be taped live in front of audiences. And we're in the middle of building out one of our stage studios in Jerusalem right now, which will accommodate a, a studio audience for some of our programming. So there are a, a variety of formats that one would consider when looking at television, but this is beyond just a television network. This is sort of a message that we're trying to reach people with. So certainly we're going to take advantage of the block of time that we have for documentaries, uh, any kind of films that we feel are consistent with our message. We're producing some of our own documentaries, mini documentaries in the form of one-hour bio pieces on interesting people that are li living fascinating lives or contributing to Israel or... Jewish Anglos that made Aliyah and are pursuing their careers and the transition between where they come from and here. Um, so there are a lot of different approaches to producing documentary style footage and reality television. But any documentary films that we see that are consistent with our message, we're absolutely interested in. The greater majority of the programming we're producing, we're producing out of Israel for a number of reasons. First of all, we're all here. Secondly, we have resources and studio facilities here that 
would otherwise be very expensive to reproduce anywhere else. And the um, ability for us to produce programming at a much more cost-effective rate here is just a smarter way to go into the market. We are looking at other opportunities that exist outside in the U.S. or other markets where we could produce a particular program. But for the most part, the primary function in production facilities is being based out of Israel. That doesn't limit our stories to only Israeli stories. There are plenty of Americans living in Israel who have fascinating world or life stories to share that are not necessarily Israel-centric, but might be Jewish-centric. I don't know so much the, um, the, the reach to non-Jews in Israel, to be perfectly truthful, but I do imagine that because we have so much more in common with the Christian community than our differences, that I believe we will reach a good portion of the Christian segment because they're also looking for family values, family entertainment, and we're offering a viable alternative for people who are seeking that. I think now we're living in a day and age where anti-Semitism is at a rapidly growing rate. And I think anything that we can do to give Jews a sense of solidarity, to give them a sense of home, to unite as many Jews together to fight that tide of anti-Semitism, that alone is reason enough to go spread a Jewish Torah Israel message. But beyond that, the reality is that people are always looking for something to improve their lives. And we believe here at Debrut that taking an interest in your Jewish lineage, your culture, the stories and the lessons and the mitzvot that we get from the Torah, from the Bible, we believe that that could be a means for many people who are otherwise not introduced to it or not introduced to it in the right way. And we want to be part of that introduction for people. We won't proselytize. We're not turning people religious, but we're giving them an opportunity to open their minds and see what this culture and religion really has to offer to better their lives. Well, I don't think that we're looking at any one particular flaw within the Jewish people and saying we're going to solve that issue. I think assimilation is a manifestation of people disconnecting from their religious culture. Um, I don't know that we're going to convince somebody through our programming that assimilation is bad. But if we've opened their mind enough to engage in their religious roots, then somewhere along their journey, they might discover a better way to proceed in that relationship if that's an issue for them. Assimilation is not the only problem. It's really keeping kids connected from a very early age. That's why we're looking at kids programming. How can we engage children and teach them about just moral family values that anyone would want their children to learn? It just so happens they're going to learn that partly through some of our programs. In our last segment of Rabbi Aftzon's teaching on the Torah scrolls, he shares with us how and why the Torah scroll has never changed and still looks the same today as it did years ago. You'd think in the 21st century, the Torah will look very different than the way it looked 2,000 years ago. It isn't. It's still 100% natural, and there is basically no sophistication and modernization that has entered the Torah scroll. It's still made out of hide of a kosher animal. The ink is all natural. Even the threads that connect one piece of parchment to the other are all natural. If you would see a Torah from 2,000 years ago, maybe the parchment would be a bit thicker because we have gotten a bit of modernism in how to deal with parchment, but pretty much it would look exactly the same. The words would be the same. It's a, such a beautiful concept that the Torahs discovered from all over the world look so similar. Yes, some Torahs are adorned differently. If you see a Torah that comes from Middle Eastern countries called Sfardi Torah, it's a very different look. It's picked up differently, but the words in the Torah are all the same. It's all natural and it's the same tradition. So if Moses would walk in to a Torah reading, 
he would be able to walk straight up to the Torah, start reading as if nothing has changed in 3,300 years. I want to tell you a story. There was once a wagon driver, and he lived in a town in Russia, a freezing cold town in Russia. One time, a businessman walks over to the wagon driver and says, I want you to take me to the marketplace, which was a few day journey away. It's in the middle of the winter, and I'm really worried that I won't make it there on time. So here's the deal. If you get me there on time, I will pay you 10 ruble, which was then an exuberant sum. If we don't get there on time, 50 ruble is what you're going to pay me because I lost out on business. Are you willing to take the gamble? The wagon driver was quite the simpleton. He says, yeah, why not? Let's go for it. To their bad luck, they don't arrive on time. They arrive the day that the market has shut. So the businessman turns to the wagon driver and says, 50 ruble, you're going to pay me. The wagon driver says, not a chance. I don't have 50 ruble. Let's go to the rabbi. So they go to the rabbi, and the rabbi turns to the wagon driver and says, is it true, sir, that you committed to pay 50 if the business did not work out? He says, yes. So the rabbi says, then pay. He says, rabbi, why? The rabbi says, because that's what the Torah says. He says, which Torah, rabbi? The, to the Torah, says the rabbi, that was given in the summertime. Rabbi, 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 rabbi. Think about it. The Torah was given in the northern hemisphere in the summertime. It was given in a desert. I promise you, if it was given in Russia in the winter, it would have said something very different. The Torah's relevance is today. Very often we'll say, ah, eh, some archaic law is given to people walking in the desert. It's not. God's eternal. God wrote the Torah with me in mind. Yes, I might be walking around with a smartphone in my pocket and think that I've evolved and become that much more sophisticated than my ancestors, which is highly doubtable. But the Torah is eternal. And we look at the Torah every week. We read the Parsha again. And we say, what's the message now? And you'll see. Thoughts on the Parsha are still popular. Any Jewish website you'll go to, Thoughts on the Parsha are the most visited pages. People want to always find what is relevant in the Torah reading of this week. Yes, we might be reading again about Abraham and Sarah, but why? What's the message? What can I take? That's the way we look at the Torah. We hug it. We kiss it. Please give me a message. Nothing is by coincidence. Every letter of the Torah has a message. The first letter in the Torah is the letter Bet, the second of the alphabet. The last letter in the Torah is Lamed. If you put those two letters together, Lamed Bet, it spells Lev, heart. We know the story about the convert who came to Hillel and said, Hillel the wise man, teach me the whole Torah while I stand on one foot. Hillel said, simple. That which you don't want done to you, do not do unto another. The Torah putting the letter Lamed and Bet, Lev, heart, as the first and last letter is reminding us, Torah is a manual for living, and it all boils down to the way we treat one another. Monotheism that only gets us to believe in God and doesn't make us better people between ourselves is faulty monotheism. We act our heart, not just our mind, not just our arms, but ours as well. Ben Zoma would say, who is rich? One who is satisfied with his lot. As is stated, if you eat of the toil of your hands, Fortunate are you, and good is to you. Fortunate are you in this world, and good is to you in the world to come. Sadly, that's all we have time for for this week's episode of Simcha. As always, it's been a pleasure to have you join us. If you'd like to be in touch with us, please find us on Facebook at Spirit Sister Productions and drop us a line. From myself, Eitan Berger, and all of us here at Simcha, have a great week and goodbye.